My name's Julian Allwood and I'm an engineer here in Cambridge and I want to talk about our use of energy. All our energy at the moment comes largely from three fossil fuels that you know very well, oil, gas and coal, and the width of the lines are in proportion to the amount that we use. Worldwide we also make use of biomass, uh, mainly in developing countries that's burning wood for heating and cooking, and we have a small amount of nuclear and hydro, but I want to focus on the big three so I'm going to hide those. On the demand side, we use energy essentially for four things, for powering our vehicles, for heating and cooling air and water in our buildings, for manufacturing, storing, transporting and processing food, and in industry, to make the capital goods with which we uh, fulfil our lives. There's also a small other category that includes lighting and communications, but again I want to focus on what's big and what's small, so I'm going to eliminate that. The reason that we care about energy is because of emissions. And the, you all know this story very well, that the emissions come from burning the uh, three fossil fuels. And in the UK, we've set a target that we want to reduce our emissions from 1990 to 2050 by 80%. And here's how we're getting on, according to our own reports. There we were in 1990, and we appear to be dropping at quite a good rate relative to the target. And we've done that by doing two things. One is that we've switched our electricity production from coal to gas. And the other is that we've shut as much of our industry as possible in order to get other countries to make our goods uh, for us. Um, we're still buying the same stuff. In fact, we're buying a great deal more. So if you account for the emissions we're causing in other countries, the green line shows that our emissions are steadily rising year on year, as they are doing in every other country in the world. In my research group, we've been trying to get a handle on this by looking at the more detail at how we use our energy worldwide. This is the sort of analysis we're doing. We're trying to trace the flow of energy from fuels through to final services through the technologies that are used to transform energy to service. So this shows the flow of global energy, and then we've got the flow of steel, in this case, through the world's economy. And we've been trying to map these various resource flows to get a better handle on what we might be able to change, what's big and what's small, and what could make a big difference. Um, we've realised recently that as well as looking at flows, uh, we need to think a little bit differently about industry because, of course, industry is making the goods that themselves turn out to transform the energy. So really, rather than being an annual flow, industry creates an accumulation of stock, of kit, which is uh, we build up over time, and then that defines our performance, the rate at which we use energy for the next few years, and also, in due course, it will tell us something about our recycling. Now, I want to look at the options that we've got to change our use of energy. And as a reference, I'm going to show uh, here the UK's use of energy. We use about 5 kilowatts. That's our steady rate demand for power. And if I divide that by the area of the UK, I get to us using one and a quarter watts per square metre. And that's important <coughs> when we start looking at alternatives, what other energies we might use. So here's our deck of cards of energy options. Thank you. And uh, the first one, oil, is extremely dense. So oil comes up at about one and a half kilowatts per cubic metre. So a cubic meter per, three cubic metres per year of oil is enough to meet our five kilowatts in the UK. Coal a bit less so, and gas, when it's underground, is pretty dense. Uh, so we're still not using a very high volume of fuel in order to create our power. But if we were to start thinking about renewables, we need a huge commitment in order to make them. We need one and a quarter watts per square metre to meet our current needs. Offshore wind requires three watts or generates three watts per square metre. So this requires a very vast commitment in the North Sea, way beyond anything that we're yet prepared to take on. Solar is about five watts per square metre, so a typical 10 square metre panel on a roof generates enough for one light bulb uh, on average over the year. And biofuels have really very little place in Europe because the energy density is so low. So we've got a problem finding any other forms of energy to replace fossil fuels. If we look at what we're doing with them, you can see that global energy demand has more than doubled over 40 years. We're still completely dominated by coal, oil and natural gas. And up there in the red area that you can hardly see is the world's commitment to renewables at the moment. It's so small, it's making almost no difference. And if I show you the proportions, here are the proportions of world energy use and renewables has only just climbed over the x-axis here. The other one I haven't mentioned, nuclear, is declining. It might actually be rather a good idea because it's, it's emissions free, or very nearly, but the public is turning against nuclear. 
And what that says is we're very short of any options to replace our energy supply, even if we generate a large amount of electricity from renewables in the future. Uh, the trouble that we have is that we aren't stopping our extraction of the fossil fuels. And I suspect that with more renewables, all we're going to do is to find new uses of the oil, such as Richard Branson's galactic space vehicle. If we're using electricity to uh, power our cars, why don't we use the oil to fly into outer space or take a half-hour journey to Australia? Maybe instead of finding alternatives, we could do the usual uh, human solution of capturing the problem and burying it underground, carbon capture and storage. Um, we can't do that to oil, unfortunately, because we need a colostomy bag on the back of every vehicle. Uh, we could do it for gas and coal, but it would take about a third more energy. About a third of the energy they generate would be used to do the capture and storage. And let's just look at the data on where we've got to with implementing this idea. These are figures from the pro-CCS uh, global lobby for last year, um, sorry, two years ago. The uh, world's emissions in 2012 were around about 51 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, and the total amount stored was three, just under 3 million tons. It's so small that you can't see it above the axis. Incredibly, this technology dominates policy discussions at the moment. But to my taste, even if it might occur in the future, it's so small I don't want to state my children's future on this working. And what I think that says is that we're rather short of options on the supply side, so we need to look at the demand side instead. And the first thing to notice when we talk about demand is just how enthusiastic we are about using energy. I am, as you can see, still very young, and in my own life, the population of the world has already doubled. But even despite the population growth, look at what we've been doing with our per person use of energy. So this is aeroplane flights per person over the last 40 years. That's the total emissions from transport per person. Here we are with material use per person, growing in some cases not even linearly, but more than linearly, as we demand more and more materials. Here's our stock of goods. There's the cars per person in the, in the world. There's the built space in square meters of built space per person in the world. We're so enthusiastic about energy that we would rather have energy than a personality. And for people like, let's say, management consultants who have m more money than personality, these, <laughs> these, ladies and gentlemen, are fridges. They're not cars at all. This is so that you can cover the void of your own identity by buying something <laughs> to demonstrate just how much energy you use. Well, what could we do on the demand side? Firstly, we might be able to switch between different fuels, and that's what we've done very successfully in the UK with our electricity generation, moving from coal to natural gas. But given that we've seen that there are no alternatives for supply, switching from other fossil fuels to electricity doesn't help, even though it's very popular. So the European Union has a policy at the moment pushing us towards electric vehicles, and here is the BMW i3 that's had a lot of publicity recently, the state-of-the-art in German technology, uh, on its own specifications, it says it releases zero emissions. And that assumes that the electricity was somehow created. Uh, but as we know, it isn't created. It comes from burning fossil fuels. And if we multiply the BMW's figure by the emissions for natural gas, we get to around about the same figure as some out-of-date bit of French engineering uh, with about the same size. So switching to electricity doesn't actually help us. What about efficiency? Maybe we could use engineering to become more efficient in the way we use energy. And we know these things very well in Cambridge. These are LED light bulbs that are great converters of electricity into light. And there are a lot of clever people looking at how we might do that around the house at the moment. So will LED light bulbs reduce our energy use overall? Let's find out. <laughs> Step forward, the Dallas Cowboys. In Dallas, if you go to see the American football game, you don't really want to watch the football. You want to watch TV, because TV is better than anything else. And so they've created one of the world's largest TVs. It's 50 meters long, 20 meters high, and the four screens in total consume one and a half megawatts of electricity, all making benefit from the LED light bulbs. Because they're so efficient, we can now make big TV TVs out of them. This rebound effect, unfortunately, means that when we make a step forwards in efficiency, we expand our use rather than contracting our demand for energy. So what can we do? Well, it seems to me we've just got to use less energy. That is the only solution that we have 
if we want to make a big difference to our emissions. And if we wanted to use less, then as engineers we've got something quite useful to say. Here's the fleet average of the cars on sale in the UK at the moment, plotted by weight here and fuel consumption here. I don't know if you can spot the trend, um, but if the car gets smaller and lighter, it uses less fuel. We don't want electric cars, we want small cars. And if you look on the website of Volkswagen, the L1 concept car, this is the 2011 version, weighs 380 kilograms, it's a two-seater, and it does 190 miles per gallon. That's what a good low-carbon car looks like, not an electric car. Do we want that? Of course we don't. This is what we want. In 1959, Sir Alec Isigonis invented the Mini in response to the Suez crisis to be fuel efficient and compact, and that, without any Photoshop, is today's Mini. We don't want small cars, we want big ones. And for the women in the audience, you could have a huge impact on the emissions of the future if you can persuade your men friends that buying a big car doesn't impress you. You'd find them more attractive with a small car. What's behind this, I think, is an equation a little bit like this. We've built our national policies, our futures, on the idea that time equals money equals energy. When I use money, I'm trading labor with you. If it's capital, I'm trading past labor. If it's an investment, I'm trading future labor. And I use energy to amplify labor, to get more service out of the same number of hours of people. I can say the same <coughs> about materials. And we believe that makes us better off. That's what national policy does. The idea of national policy, of the GDP metric, is that if I work hard and make more to sell to you, then you've got more money and you then buy more off me. And if we spend and we buy faster and faster, we're all better off. That is the essence of national policy in the entire developed world, that we need the money to go around faster and faster and faster. We've watched down to Nabi and we know that having more servants is the aspiration of us all. And that's what we believe here. More GDP, more energy, more servants for me. And yet, I think there are some things that we can't delegate to, service, to, to servants to do on our behalf. When I'm playing tennis, however badly I'm doing, even if I'm 5-1 one, one down in the final set, I still don't want to delegate the next shot to a servant. I'm going to do it myself because it's what I enjoy. In my marriage... There are things I don't want to delegate to anybody else. <laughs> when I'm singing a song, I don't want to delegate that to anybody else either because it's part of my identity. And maybe above everything, when I'm in the bath, I want to remember what this chap's experiencing. That seems to me to be an essential statement of human identity and happiness that we've all forgotten here. I can't see anything about the wealth of his family in there, but my goodness, is he having a great time and that time he's having isn't recorded in GDP. So where I think we've gone wrong is that we're measuring the wrong thing. What we should be measuring is the quality of our time, the quality of life we're having. And maybe we should be measuring more about the stock of what we own rather than the rate at which we're replacing it. And if we're going to do that, I think we need a dialogue way beyond engineering and technology and science. We need to talk to big, hairy sociologists. We need to engage with belief, with identity, with values about who we are. What do we aspire to be? Is it really more money or is it more tennis or more time in the bath or more time kissing? I think I have a preference there. We need to engage with entertainment. We've got to share ideas, to have a conversation across the whole spectrum of society about what we mean by identity and why we want to pursue uh, as a national goal uh, money as opposed to time and what we own. So it's about people. I started the title with the talk talking about our use of energy. And as an engineer, it's natural to talk about use of energy. That's where we're comfortable. But my conclusion is that what we need to be do doing is talking about us. Because if we can think about our identity and our use of energy, maybe it'll turn out we're very much better off with using less of it. Thank you. <laughs>